note investing is very similar to banking. It is just purchasing a set number of payments at a certain interest rate, at a certain term, usually at a discount. As note investors, we enjoy the security of the property without the risk of ownership. Hello there and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. I hope you're doing really well. It's great to have you here. My name's Rick Nusky. I'm the host of this show that gets you in front of your best audience and keeps you there. And on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming former Special Forces Green Bear and uh, founder of Apex Capital and Legacy Land Fund, along with his partner, Eric Sharga, Mr. Quinn MacArthur. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you, Rick. Great to have you here. Now, you, um, we, should I say, are all going to be talking about how you can create passive income through land note investing. But uh, we often start off with a bit of a, a bit of a sidestep, which I really enjoy, and we learn a little bit about the guests. So, starting off with you, Quinn, where are you calling in from today? I'm in a, uh, a suburb of Jacksonville, Florida. It's called Ponte Vedra Beach. So I live here with my uh, my young family, and we're enjoying the the coastal life and the nice warm weather here in Florida. Fantastic. Now, Eric, uh, I don't know if that's a, uh, a, a like a virtual backdrop, but it seems to me you've got uh, the alternate weather there. How about you? Where are you calling <laughs> from today? <laughs> that, that's an alternative background. I'm in the suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, um, so uh, you guys move around for work, or how does it how does it operate? No, no. no well, I'm pretty. I'm, we we stay pretty well put. I don't need to, I don't really leave my little bubble here in the, in the southeast of the United States. Fantastic. Well, look, we're going to obviously be taking a deeper dive into all of the work that you guys are doing. But, uh, you know, first, before we do that, it's, it's the, I guess the unique part about the My Future Business Show, Quinn, Eric, is that we take a little bit of a sidestep to learn a bit about you. Now, tell us a little bit about the things you like to do when you're not working. Is there any time <laughs> to do anything and, or is it all work? Well, the good thing about, and I think we'll get into this, the good thing about our business model that it does allow us quite a bit of time to spend with our families. Fantastic. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a passive investing model um, as opposed to some other models that are uh, quite active. They might seem like they're passive on the surface, but they're, um, they're anything but. And so in my free time, it's um, I, my hobbies kind of went by the wayside and that's okay once I started having kids. And so I spend um, most of my time with them at their sporting events. And like I mentioned, kind of at the beach and um, like to, uh, you know, pretty active in our community and in our church. Fantastic. Excellent. Now, uh, just before I uh, step away to Eric and get some more from you, Eric, Quinn, tell us a little bit about uh, your background as a Green Beret. Yeah, I, I um, graduated from West Point in 2008. And um, the first part of my Army career was in the um, infantry. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division in North Carolina. And uh, in the second half of my career, I was in the 7th Special Forces Group, where I had the privilege of commanding a, um, an operational detachment, um, did several deployments. And, um, and like, I, I, like I say a lot, it, it, was, it was kind of a, a perfect training ground for entrepreneurship and business ownership um all the kind of the 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 gray area and the subjectivity of everything you were doing was um it was a great experience i had a, the privilege of serving some great um soldiers and under some some awesome commanders and had some awesome mission sets i'd love so to was, uh, i'd love to come back to that because i've looked at your wonderful family and i wonder a little bit about um, you know legacy and discipline and all those types of things and how that sort of flowed on into your family life, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So Eric, how about yourself? Yeah, so in terms of my background, I was a high school English teacher for 23 years. I um, started in real estate about 20 years ago doing fix and flip, buy and holds. I came across note investing in 2016 and re just really fell in love uh, with the business. Uh, during COVID, I wrote a book about note investing called Lean Lord. And um, I, for in terms of what I do for fun, I play some golf. I play really bad golf. <laughs> I play pickleball during the summer. Oh, I hang out with my family, love to travel with my family and uh, hang out with friends. You know, I'm looking forward to the summer. I, unfortunately, I don't have the endless summer like Quinn does. Oh, <laughs> it's pretty crummy here about six months a year, but you know, we're right on the press. Yeah, I like to rub that in every chance. Oh, I, I bet get. you do. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's funny, the first time I ever heard about pickleball was through Bill Gates. How did you find out about this wonderful game? So I'm a tennis player and I had this horrible case of tennis elbow and I just decided that I was going to take a break and I took a break for about six months and I tried it and I actually, I don't think I'll go back to tennis. It's horrible of me to say that, but oh. I think I probably like it more. <laughs> I love it. Now, in terms of uh, the daily routines, you're obviously in slightly different locations. So I'm wondering if we could break down what a day looks like for you. You're both early risers. I am. Uh, it's a habit. I, I can't break from the army, but yeah. um, no, I like to get up, get up early and do some reading and try to keep my head down through the morning hours, do some, a lot of like project based stuff and then leave the remaining, the, the afternoon hours for um, exercise, spending time with the family and a lot of phone calls and zoom calls. Yeah. Well, I'm not an early riser, Eric. What about you? I definitely am not. I I got up at 5 a.m. for 23 years, and when I uh, retired from my job, I I said I was never going to do it again. So I, I get up anywhere between like, you know, 5:30 and 6:30 in the morning, and uh, I usually I do some work in the morning, then I usually go to CrossFit, and then I usually start my day around like 10:15. Yep, yep. And then you know that pretty much goes until you know about five o'clock, but there's breaks in there. But, you know, that's the one thing about being a business owner is that uh, to a certain degree, you're always on. Yes, absolutely. So, Quinn, given uh, the um, great amount of discipline that you must have, do you ever give yourself permission to say, nah, I'm just going to pull the covers over my head and stay in bed? Stay in bed? Yeah. Um, no, I don't do that. I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I tried, my, my six-year-old twins would probably come find me pretty early, pretty quickly. I love it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, um, if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you had a, a bucket list and, uh, you know, before we shift into the core of the core, I always love to do this part of the call. If you had a bucket list, what's on it and where would you like to go? Do you have any travel destinations that you're still on your list? I'd like to come see you in Australia, Rick. Oh, I'm, a scuba, I'm a scuba diver and oh. I love to. I'd love to explore the waters in your neck of the woods, man. Oh, I'll tell you what, they are absolutely beautiful. I actually remember getting my dive ticket through Paddy. And when I was in Indonesia, of all places, and uh, Paddy Dive Centre, and that was a great experience. But I tell you what, come off to the coasts of uh, South Australia, if you know anything about Rodney Fox, the great white shark uh, got attacked just off our beach down at Aldinga Beach. And, uh, yeah, that's a story. If you want to see the big fish, come our way. I will. <laughs> so what have you seen in terms of your diving? Are you like a deep sea, deep sea, or what do you do? Uh, no, just, just pretty easy, like just... You know, nothing too deep. Um, I like to spearfish as well. And, you know, a lot of times those are in Florida. You don't have to go too too far or too deep to, to find some good fish. The yes. keys are great for that. And um, uh, But I love I love wreck dives recreationally, oh, yeah. so I don't know if they have those there. But uh, yeah. up, and, up and down the coast of the Carolinas, they have some great wrecks. And even in North Florida, where, where I live, there's some springs. Uh, ah. which I've only done once, but I'd like to do more of it. They have these natural springs all across kind of the, the panhandle of Florida, all, mm -hmm. all the way across into where I am in the northeast side of Florida. And they have these beautiful blue springs in the middle of woods, in the woods where you yep. can explore and, uh, you know, try not to go too deep with your with your gear there for fear of getting yeah, lost down no. there. But, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty pretty fun. Not coming back up. And now, Eric, in terms of uh, handicaps, I'm probably the most handicapped golfer in the world. Do you have a handicap? Do you play well or are you just coring grass? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just tearing up the grass. I'm not even good enough to have a <laughs> handicap. <laughs> That's great news because now I, I don't, don't even feel... make the scale. <laughs> now I don't feel so bad. Now, in terms of your in, uh, individual entrepreneurial uh, experiences into this world, when I was young, my first experience was washing cars. Tell us, Quinn, what was yours? First entrepreneurial experience was yes, uh, directly out of um, the army. When I was leaving the army, I, I met a colonel who was retired, who was investing in mortgage notes. He was right. investing in these mortgage notes. And he was my first kind of introduction to, you know, he had his, he was retired. So he had all, all the time in the world and wanted to spend every waking hour with his kids and his, his leisure goals, as he called them. And, um, and so I kind of uh, saw what he was doing and and invested alongside of him and kind of created just a, you know, just a basic LLC and was just doing small deals here and there when I had time. And that was my first introduction to it was actually 
just your real estate investing, but in some small, simple deals in Florida, actually. How about you, Eric? Washing cars, so, what was it? No, it wasn't really washing cars. <laughs> I had a lot of jobs starting out in high school, but I really got my start in real estate when I was 29. And I was on summer vacation for my teaching job. And I got this continuing education brochure about, and one of the classes in there was being taught by this guy who was going to teach students how to buy, basically buy and profit from foreclosures. And I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. So I signed up for the class and I took the class. And the guy who taught it was just a complete nut. And he basically had us bring in, I mean, this was 20 years ago. So, you know, there was no internet. No. And it was basically like bring in um, list, uh, newspaper ads of potential motivated sellers. And that was really the beginning for me. From there, um, I got my real estate license and I met these attorneys who were flipping homes in Chicago. And um, it just kind of continued from there. there. You know, I find the trajectory of our lives to be intriguing. You know, you started off as a Green Beret, you've started off in your field, Eric, and then all of a sudden you've you've come to this uh, intersection in your lives and you, you met up with each other and you decided to, to go about this venture. Tell us a little bit about that moment. How did that come about? Uh, I met Eric through a mutual friend. We were actually both investing with, with a buddy of ours. Um, hmm. So we didn't know each other, but we knew our friend very well. And um, so it was actually our, our mutual friend that made the connection. I, I was kind of telling this guy uh, kind of what I, what I wanted to do, where I, what, you know, he obviously knew where, where I was coming from, but it was kind of telling him my goals and, you know, aspirations and sounded like Eric and he were having similar conversations. And so, uh, our, my buddy Dave was, was the matchmaker there. And we, uh, you know, that, that was our initial connection. Because I know that, uh, in the notes that I had read in the bio that, uh, the connection has basically changed your life. Tell us a little bit about how everything's transformed for you both. Yeah, I mean, note investing has changed my life. It's it's what's helped me um, leave my uh, my W two job. I used to work for a, a real estate developer, hmm. um, and this the, my portfolio of the note, the notes and cash flow that came from it. The, the the passive cash flow, the predictable nature of everything was was enough to support my family. Um, and so we're you know the the fund that we created together is really just doing more of the same. Um, mm -hmm. Something that we we've, we've put our faith into, we put our, our, our own time and effort and our own capital into this for, for years now. And so the fund is really just opening the opportunity, opening the door to others to kind of realize the opportunities that are in this niche and just invest alongside of us. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, how good it must be to live life on your own terms. Thanks to this, uh, I guess it's a form of passive income. Would that be correct? Is that how it works? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's their monthly payments that come in from these, from these notes. Um, and it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, obviously didn't get to choose, uh, where I lived or, or what my schedule was, uh, when I was in the army. In fact, I missed the first almost two years of my, my first son's life. And so, um, you know, when we learned we were having twins, I was like, man, I'm never again. Will I you know, <laughs> not have the option, not have the freedom to, to, um, to kind of pick my own schedule. And so now I, you know, I live, live where I want to live and, you know, create my own schedule and, you know, pick and choose partners, uh, as, as, as time goes on and different ventures. So no, it's, it's great. So there's more, more time, uh, more just freedom to, you know, um, not only do what you want to do in business, but also outside of work, you know, whether it comes to, um, spending more time with, with family, yep. um, investing in your community yep. and, you know, supporting your church and everything else. So what about you, Eric? You would have noticed this, uh, some time ago. How's it changed your life? Um, you know, it's been huge. I, I dreamt about being a full-time investor, uh, for probably about 15 years before I actually did it. And I originally thought that I was going to achieve that dream through um, landlording, through buy and hold real estate investing. And I found that in 
business to be incredibly volatile. Mm. And, it, and at one point, I just realized that it just wasn't going to happen. And I was really at a crossroads in my life. I had a family. I had a mortgage. I just was kind of falling out of love with, uh, with my full-time job. And I knew I had to pivot into something else with real estate. And I listened to a podcast with a note investor and I thought, this is like, this is crazy. This is more like banking than it is real estate investing. And that was really the beginning for me. And I, I slowly segued out of buy and hold investing and into note investing. So um, it really has been a a game changer for me. It is not something that will happen overnight for you, mm. but over time it will really produce a, a freedom that will allow you to run a business with a cell phone and a laptop from anywhere in the world. See, I know it sounds, I know it sounds too good to be true. It's <laughs> not, but it does take time to develop. It takes years to develop. Um, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Mm -hmm. So anyone who tells you that they can, teach you that that's just not true see having the, the we've touched on freedom of time and place um to hang out and you know do things with the ones that you love more often there's there's a lot of benefits that come from this but i think it's from a fundamental level important for us to talk about um what it actually is and if you could explain it to us that would be wonderful yeah so note investing is very similar to banking it is just purchasing a set number of payments at a certain interest rate at a certain term, usually at a discount. And the beauty about it is that you know exactly what your set yield or the return on your investment is going to be when you purchase a loan and there are no hidden expenses, no insurance to go up, no repairs, no replacements, no risk of fire. Um, that is all on the owner of the property. So as note investors, we enjoy the security of the property without the risk of ownership. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, I just wonder, just for clarification, for those who don't really understand it, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's some complexities in this, is are we talking about vacant land? Are we talking about established land? Are we talking commercial, residential? What are we talking about here? It's it's vacant land exclusively. Right. Yeah, we um, as Eric said, you know, we we stay away from anything with improvements on it, um, very deliberately, very intentionally. Um, you know, tenants tenants are great when they pay rent, but there it's, you know there can be tenant issues, there can of be course. maintenance issues, and so yeah, what we're talking about our our underlying asset, the collateral behind all this uh, these notes is vacant lands, raw land. Yeah, because that's what and struck me about it. I didn't really understand it. Go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say, Rick, regarding vacant land, there's really been an increase in interest in vacant land since COVID. And it's for a variety of reasons. The first one is that people desire space right now. Um, a lot of our end buyers are super interested in living on a five to 10 acre property. And, and the, the, since COVID, there's been a real change in remote work. And more and more jobs are either half remote or 100% remote, which really allows people the flexibility of being able to live where they'd like. And there's been a lot of advancements in delivery services, uh, Starlink satellite internet, advancements in solar and battery. And that's really allowing people to kind of live not completely off the grid, but maybe further out in which... Um, they're going to get a lot more space and they're going to have more of the uh, beauty of nature that you don't get in suburbia. Um, a lot of our buyers don't want to have to um, uh, fight over the existing low number of houses on the market. And they decide, you know, I'm going to buy my own vacant land. I'm going to develop my own property. Um, additionally, a lot of people um, who uh, live or have a mobile home have decided that I would much rather buy a parcel, one acre, two acre parcel with seller financing versus living in a park in which I'm going to have to pay lot rent forever. Yes. So it really provides people today a lot of flexibility in where they choose to live. And I, I personally don't see that changing anytime soon. 
So would this be east to west coast? Um, you know, can you see this expanding in that regard? Or is yeah, it there's already a few unit? states. We'd, yeah, east. I mean, all over the United States, uh, okay. with with the exception of a few states. But yeah, pretty much, pretty much everywhere. And then I would add to what Eric said is it's not always a home site. You know, I, I, we've noticed an uptick um, even prior to COVID, but especially you know, COVID kind of um, expedited this. But recreational land, whether it's for hunting or ATV or mm -hmm. Um, camping, pulling your RV out there, like it, they don't intend to improve this land. And maybe it's 70 acres in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, that a, a hunter wants to go out there and, and enjoy with his family. We see a lot of that, that as well and growing. It's interesting because, you know, having lived on a farm for most of my life, I think about cattle and all the other livestock that you would have. Do you ever, do you ever see that sort of situation, even though they may not be developing on it, that they may, you know, have, you know, animals, let's call it on there? Yeah, some borrowers would have, you know, livestock out there. They usually do that for tax reasons. But mm. no, I mean, it, yeah, that's um, uh, it, it could be. But most of the time it's it's completely vacant. And it weren't that, you know, our lender, a lot of our borrower, a lot of times is not is not in, in the farming industry. They're either building a home site or they're enjoying it just recreationally. Certainly learning a lot very quickly about this. I'm loving this call, gentlemen. Thank you so very much. Now, tell me, what type of people are you attracting to this to this uh, product? So, <laughs> so our fund, we have a proprietary method of working with vacant land sellers who want to offer seller financing and the flexibility of seller financing, but don't necessarily want to hold the note. So what we do is we help them offer the seller financing. We go through the entire procedure with them, and then we end up buying the note from them at closing at discount which increases our yield from the face value of the note. And the vast majority of our uh, borrowers are end users. So they're purchasing the land either to enjoy or to develop or for a retirement um, home. That There's just a, a variety of reasons. But we really do not sell to developers. Mm -hmm. We sell essentially or we lend to end users yeah that makes a lot of sense so at the end of the day um at the end of the term i guess there is a term is the is the person who's bought the product actually just a steward of the land or do they actually end up owning it so they own it um immediately right. so when they purchase it their name is on the property their name is on the deed and the lender just uh retains a lien on the property which gives them the right if there's ever any default to foreclose on the property. I try to get so it. They, Go ahead. I was just going to say they have the full um, right rights of ownership and they can do whatever they want with the land, as long as it's legal, of course. Of course. Thank you very much for the feedback. Now, I try to be the devil's advocate in some way so that we can draw out the fundamentals so that people who don't understand this process, because it's brand new to some people who are listening to this call today, What's a first lien position? Please explain. So the way the title works is typically first in time, first in right. And first lien just means that it's the first mortgage that's filed against the property. And it has the first right to the property in case there's any, ever any type of liquidation or default. They're the first in line to get paid from the sale of the property. Got it. Is there a sliding scale of returns based on area, the size of the lot? Does it work like that or is it just a static fixed sort of thing? Um, so we do see a, a wide variety in values, but typically we are working in the sub $150,000 value space. And that's a space that typically banks do not like to finance just because the cost of the financing for them, mm. it's not really worth it for them to write a loan for under $150,000. Right. And some banks don't like to write loans on vacant land anyway. So we love that space. We think that seller financing is perfect for that. Um, and and there's just a lot of demand right now for seller financing, knowing that um, an end buyer might not have $50,000 to purchase the land, but they do have $10,000 and they can make monthly payments.
there you go. So there's opportunities for the right people. I'm wondering though, for those clients who do decide to work with you and they see the opportunity in it, do they need to meet any particular requirements to be a participant? So they do need to meet a credit requirement. And the biggest one is they need to meet a down payment requirement. Typically it's a 20% down payment. Fantastic. Now, I, I also wonder um, about the, you talked about the $10,000 investment as opposed to 50,000. Is there a minimum and a maximum for that matter? Um, personally, I like um, sales prices of at least $30,000 and above. And, you know, our fund typically maxes out at about $150,000 sales price because we like to spread our risk out amongst a, many different markets across the United States, amongst many different borrowers. So given the nature of the product and um, my limited understanding of the whole process, tell me what some what are some of the things that um, people that will be watching this today should be aware of before approaching you? We, we've talked about price, we've talked about process. Is there anything else that, you know, that they should come to you armed with before, you know, reaching out? History, bank history, things like that. What do they need to provide you? He's talking about from the from the asset management side? From any side. It, it, when somebody, come, say I came to you and I was the case study and I said, look, Eric Quinn, I'm really keen on this product. I don't know uh, much about it. We've talked about price. We've talked about, uh, you know, I've got to know this and I've got to have that to participate. Is there anything else that um, they should be aware of? No, I mean from the from the in, in from the land investor side and from the borrower side, it's pretty simple. Yeah, okay, we we close everything through title, and so everything is is just um, documents ready for for their review. But no, I mean, um, I think we, when you ask the question, what when someone approaches us, what are they what are they looking for? I think Eric's. Uh, answer about the kind of on the the asset management side and the land investor side and kind of within our strategy, like those are our clients and customers. I think on the flip side of that, um, if I were to answer that question, since this is kind of my my wheelhouse here is is the ideal client on the investor side. So right. not only so we have a lot of activities within the fund, um, but to your to your audience. Yep. Uh, uh, the. <clears throat> they, they would be, you know, if, maybe they're not interested in doing this actively, you know, as Eric said, it's, it takes up quite a while to kind of build your, your, uh, not only your skill set, but just, just build your portfolio until it, you know, to the point where it's kind of, it's meaningful and it moves the needle. That's what this whole fund is for. It, it's, it's to, it's kind of a done for you solution. Eric and I manage these deals within the, within our portfolio, within the fund. Never. Um, and so we're providing opportunities for others to take to take their capital and sit, simply place it within the fund and let us let us run these these strategies within the fund. So I mean, it, it's you know when I invest, sometimes you don't you have to understand what you're investing in mm -hmm. and understand the strategy behind it certainly, um, and do your own due diligence. But at the end of the day, it's it's um, it comes down to who's operating that fund and who's managing it, and do I do I trust them? Um, and so the ideal client coming from you know, from that perspective would be those that, that, that want exposure to real estate, um, but don't necessarily want to get their hands dirty per se. You know, they want it, they want something a little more passive. They're tired of the volatility in the stock market and they, um, and they're looking for cash flow. They're looking for a second stream of income. Yeah. Um, and so where do you place it? You know, the, the options are endless, um, but picking, picking a strategy and then picking a manager who's, who's doing that strategy is, kind of a step one and two. So we think this fund is, you know, in terms of safety and predictability, um, there's obviously, obviously we're biased, but <laughs> because that's what we've, we've been doing for years. And that's yeah, what's yeah. kind of like, like we said, changed our lives, changed our trajectories. Um, but that's what we would, that's what we recommend. Absolutely. It's very exciting. Now at the start of the call, Eric, you talked about not being a, a get uh, rich quick scheme. How long are we talking about? What's what's the sort of turnaround from initial investment to start seeing the rewards from the investment? So you're going to see the rewards immediately upon your first note purchased or your first investment in a note fund. And it's just a matter in terms of your yield. And the beauty is that you're going to 
uh, receive exactly what you expect for the entire lifetime of the investment. It just depends on your goals in terms of uh, the cash flow that you're looking for, the yield that you're looking for, the amount that you have to invest, and what you need to be able to uh, live on or what your goals are in terms of your cash flow. So I would say that that's probably different for everyone. Fantastic feedback. Loving this call. Now, are there any risks? You know, there's to me, there's positive risk and negative risk. We've talked about some of the, I guess, the positive risks. Are there anything else like external forces and things like that? What's happening with politics, uh, interest rates? What should people be aware of? So I would say the biggest risk in note investing is the borrower stops paying. Ah. That's the biggest risk. And if that happens, you always have the right to, to foreclose on the property, which means that you go through the legal process of selling the collateral to recapture what you are owed on the loan. So we typically try to stay around 50%. Our maximum investment is about 50% of what the property is worth. And we feel that that conservative approach would allow us to weather pretty much anything that happens um, within the land markets. Um, even if the land prices, for some reason, if there's some major calamity that caused land prices to drop by 50%, we would still be okay. The other, the other issue here is that um, Quinn and I have uh, made very large personal investments in the fund, mm -hmm. and that has created a very large difference between what the fund brings in every month and what is needed to pay investors their preferred return. And the difference between those two, uh, it compounds over time and it's used to buy additional loans. So we believe that the combination of those factors really makes um, an investment that's safe for investors, but there's never any guarantees in life. No, of course not. The only, what's the, what do they say? The only guarantees is uh, death and taxes. Now, Quinn, <laughs> when you first got involved, you know, put yourself back into that moment where you started talking to Eric about this wonderful opportunity. What was some of the, the first questions that you had about the process? Can you recall them? Uh, about the process, I mean, we again, it was nothing new. I mean, everything that we're doing within the fund is just everything that that Eric and I had been doing, you know, independently yeah. uh, for years and years. And so it's like, well, let's just kind of do more of the same. And the, and the cool thing about this business model is that it's it truly is scalable. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take, a, a, you know, a bunch of satellite offices all over the country to do this, where we can we can invest from the comfort of our home, our little bubble here and and do our own due diligence on the the assets and on the borrowers. And um, and so really the question is, how big do we want to make this? Like yeah. how much time do we want to spend um, raising capital and and deploying capital into safe investments? I mean, how, how big do we want to get it? It's, a good, I guess, a good problem to have. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Sky's the limit. So I, I, I wonder, um, you, you obviously had enough knowledge, uh, Eric, about this whole industry to go and write a, a guide on it called Lean Lord. Tell us a little bit about that and what will people find inside? Uh, so it is basically, it makes the case for why you would want to invest in mortgage notes. There is a section on vacant land because vacant land is a little different than residential mortgage mm -hmm. loan investing but it compares mortgage notes to a lot of other different investments. It goes through the process of buying, where to locate them, how to do some basic due diligence. Um, it is just, it's designed as really an introduction. I make the point that this should never be an all or nothing thing, but I think that there's a benefit to allocating a portion of your overall portfolio to a non allocated asset class like this that is real estate based without the risk of ownership so you've obviously seen the results yourself i always think about the, the end client that you serve how does that make you feel when you see them getting results that's probably one of the best things about what we do 
you know, and, and I don't, we haven't really hit quite on, you know, exactly what the offering is, but when people invest they're they start receiving returns on month one, yeah. you know, they can choose to take distributions, um, you know, a direct ACH back into their, uh, into their bank account, Beautiful. or, um, uh, let the, let, let those returns compound within the fund, uh, which can get really interesting over time. And so, um, yeah, that really is that really is uh, the best part of what we do is is watching folks who who want to come in and you know they they trust us enough to to safely deploy capital and they invest alongside us uh, alongside us truly we're partners in mm-hmm. in, the, in every deal and um, and then kind of watching it I always like to I need a better phrase but really watch that like move the needle in their lives you know mm-hmm. that additional cash flow what can they do with it you know kind of opens the doors gives more opportunities and that's that's really the most it's the funnest thing about this. Absolutely. Now, I, I think about due diligence, making informed decisions. I think about education. I think the podcast is a really good, I guess, gateway into learning more and connecting uh, with your business. So uh, what type of, I guess, edu- ongoing educational relationship do you have with the people that you work with? Do you make yourself available to ask questions along the way? How's it work? Eric? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So our investors receive um, access to a portal in which we have ongoing metrics about the fund. Yep. We also send out a quarterly update, a quarterly newsletter that provides ongoing metrics about the fund. And so they can actually see the numbers, um, everything that we're doing, the number of loans, the difference between what we're taking in and what we're paying investors. So they can actually see the numbers beside behind the health of the fund. And additionally, they can always reach out to us if they have questions about um, anything related to the fund. But I would just like to stress that unlike other traditional real estate investments, this is a pretty boring model. It <laughs> simply consists of taking in monthly payments just like a bank would. And, you know, we, we typically, um, the fund averages about 20% uh, yield and we pay investors 10%. And the difference over time is simply used to uh, create new loans or purchase additional loans. And it really creates the snowball effect over time of creating a healthier and healthier fund that can pretty much withstand any, anything that happens um, outside in in the markets i tell you what it could be as uh boring as watching the grass grow if it works that's all i think isn't that really matters here now tell me a little bit about uh, i guess there's a relationship between uh this organization and apex capital tell us how what's the relationship there oh that's so i mean so i invest exclusively in real estate right. and um and so, but obviously you need to diversify. And so this, what we've been talking about in the, in the, the note investing space is, is purely income based. Yeah. I mean, it's not, we're not going to, we're not going to five X capital, you know, uh, quickly. It's not a get rich quick. It's very stable, mm-hmm. it's very predictable, but the, the, the risk and return profile is fairly low. Um, Apex capitals. I, I come from a, a commercial real estate development background. So I do more of the same yeah. uh, within Apex capital and, investing with um, partners to to develop out parcels um, I'm into you know mobile home investing self storage parks um, RV parks and so on uh, but the fund is really the focus for the next uh, for the foreseeable future, foreseeable it's, future. Such a, it's such an opportunity for for investors to get in who maybe they've tried their hand at real estate um, and and like Eric you know they're kind of like oh man it's really not what it's cracked up cracked up to be Maybe they did well, but they just kind of got tired of it. It's it kind of more of a kind of a, a drain on their time. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fund is really the focus. It's it's been, uh, you know, we we just kicked off not long ago, but it's 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 picking up steam very quickly. I love it. You know, if you can make my life easy, you can uh, bring some income my way. I'll be all the doors open. Bring it on. <laughs> now, tell me, in terms of the onboarding process, what what's that going to look like? Yeah, I mean, our our. Uh, we we ask our folks to do a call with us. We want to really make sure that we have all their answers and concerns uh, answered. Yep. And just really go in the weeds, like what questions you have. We really want to develop a relationship with that investor because we hope that it's long term. You know, this is something that it's um, for the first year. It's a, their their capital will be 
uh, committed to the fund. After that, they can redeem up to 100% of that capital, yeah. of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's a long term investment. And we take it very seriously. So the first step is to have a call. Um, and then when people are comfortable and folks are comfortable, they'll um, in conjunction with the call, rather, they'll review some some documents that we have that kind of explain more about the business model, explain more about why we do what we do. Um, and then from there, it's, it's fairly simple. We sign up, you know, you sign up on a uh, partnership agreement, a, uh, a private placement memorandum and an operating agreement. Yep. And we wire the funds and, and, you know, month in month one, they start receiving their, uh, their uh, distributions. And the cool thing is because of, because it's monthly folks are, you know, they want to, over time, they hope to, or we hope, and, and it's our, our goal to have them invest um, even more into the fund um, as they see kind of the, the progress and as they get more and more comfortable. The bigger the pool, the bigger the returns. That's fair. Makes, uh, seems to work for me. Now, in terms of the website, where are people going to go to find you? It's www.legacylandfund.com. Fantastic. So if you're on today's call and you've heard what we've been speaking about and you want to learn more, make sure to visit that domain. I'll be making sure that's available to you no matter where you see this call. This is just the, I guess, the gateway to finding more information. Go to that website and, and learn as much as you can. Do your due diligence and reach out to both Quinn and Eric. And guys, Quinn, Eric, thank you so very much for joining me on the My Future Business Show today. It's a pleasure. Thank Rick. you, Rick.